Hello, this is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater. Before we begin our program, I'd like to let you know that free newsletters are available from our ministry. Just email us at cdebater at aol.com and give us your mailing address and we'll mail them out to you for free. You can also call us at 512-218-8022 and leave your address there. You can also access all our newsletters online by going to one of our three websites called BibleQuery.org. Once on the homepage, simply click on the Experience box and then scroll down to the newsletter section as shown here. Since our number one most watched video of the over 548 videos we have produced for YouTube at the time of this recording is... Unpopular Bible Doctrines, number one, The Biblical God No One Wants to Know, with over 433,000 viewings. Our latest newsletter is called Unpopular Topic, How Sovereign is God? Our second most viewed YouTube video is Six-Year-Old Wife of Muhammad Was Okay by the Muslim God Allah, But Not by the Biblical God of Jesus with over 341,000 viewings. We also have three newsletters available on Islam. Our video, Debate, Larry Wessels versus Two Jehovah's Witnesses at a University Study Center, currently has close to 150,000 views. See our newsletter on the Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses, Deceived Deceivers. Our video, Is Jesus God Almighty in the Flesh, meaning the second person of the Trinity, or is he something else, has over 101,000 viewings. See our newsletter, Testimony to the Eternal Godhead, the Trinity. Our video, Biography, the famous 19th century Prince of Preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a man of God, has close to 89,000 views. See two of our newsletters with lead articles from sermons by Spurgeon. Our video, UFOs, Ancient Aliens or Beings of the Fourth Dimension, number one, fact or fiction, has over 207,000 viewings. Not only do UFOs and the occult use the same disciplines such as levitation, teleportation of objects, psychokinesis, clairvoyance, automatic writing, and telepathy, but their theologies are completely foreign to biblical Christianity. UFO theologies include everything from reincarnation and evolution to man achieving cosmic godhood but they do not include Jesus Christ as the only mediator between God and man, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. We have two newsletters related to the world of the occult to which UFOs are a part. Our video, Former Roman Catholic Bride of Christ, Nun Testifies of Abnormal Life in the Convent, has over 67,000 viewings. Our video featuring former Roman Catholic Rob Zins, who has a Master of Theology from Dallas Theological Seminary, historical split between Roman Catholicism and the Christ of the Scripture, man's word or God's word, has over 53,000 viewings. See our two newsletters on the subject of Roman Catholicism. Our video, Cult of Ellen G. White, number one, Beginnings of the 19th century religion, called Seventh-day Adventism, has over 48,000 viewings and features former Seventh-day Adventist Wallace Slattery, who has 44 years' experience with this religion. Our playlist, called Dealing with Seventh-day Adventism and Their Prophetess, features 15 videos with 14 hours of material. See our newsletter, Seventh-day Adventism, True or False. For theological music lovers, see our video, Favorite 
old time Christian bluegrass gospel music, Psalm 98 verses four and five. With over 214,000 viewings, we have also posted several music videos by my own daughter, Marlena Wessels, from her CD, Win This Fight, songs she has written and performed herself. To see our music videos, please go to our main YouTube channel page, scroll down to our multiple playlists, arrow over to our playlist called Our Radio Shows with National Christian Authors and Music Vids. Once there, scroll down to the bottom of the playlist where the music videos are listed. I could go on and on, but this should be sufficient for now. Don't forget to check out our main YouTube channel, C Answers TV, which stands for Christian Answers Television, also which has over 19 playlists by topic as you scroll down our channel page. Now, on with our main presentation. advice of someone, I changed the, the title from uh, Confronting the Cult to Answering the Cult, because we don't want to be confronted, do we? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I want to thank you for coming. This is going to be a six-part series, and each part will be repeated on Thursday from 12.30 to 1.30. If you know of anyone who couldn't come tonight, uh, we thought we would try to have one during the daytime. and. Uh, uh, tonight we're going to be covering uh, characteristics of the cult, and then next week we'll be uh, covering the Jehovah's Witnesses. And then the third week it'll be Mormonism. The fourth week, the Unification Church. And the fifth week will be uh, the New Age religion. We're going to, if, if you've uh, studied New Age teaching at all, you know that there are a lot of groups that adhere to the same basic teaching, so we're not going to go for just one group. We're going to kind of hit the hit the highlights of the basic uh, beliefs and uh, philosophies of all of them. And then the last week, we're uh, going to have kind of a worst of the rest. Uh, all the minor cults that we didn't cover are, um, and uh, maybe cover three or four of those. We'll also have time for extended question and answer, perhaps. If uh, at the end of each session, we're, you're welcome to stick around if you have questions for Larry. And uh, you, well, you're going to be speaking for about 45 minutes or so at each session. So there'll be there'll be time for questions uh, after each session. But if you want to be jotting down a question that you didn't get to ask or don't feel comfortable in asking at the uh, last session, we will uh, answer those. I want to introduce to you uh, who's going to be teaching this series. Is Larry Wessel. Uh, is a, an expert on witnessing people in the cult and understanding the cult. Uh, he is the director of Dayspring Evangelism, which is an outreach of Dayspring Fellowship, an independent uh, church here in, in town that meets at the, uh, the American Legion Hall at the corner of uh, Lake Austin Boulevard in Mopac. And Larry is a graduate of UT in advertising, and he has been uh, studying cult extensively for nine years. He has studied uh, by extension under perhaps the most well-known expert on the cult, uh, Walter Martin, who just recently passed away, and uh, as well as had the seminary training by extension through Regent College. And Larry was a former editor of a magazine that used to be here in Austin that I didn't even know about, a Christian magazine called, what was the name of that? The Believer's Guide. The Believer's Guide. And uh, he uh, contributed articles to that. Uh, Larry has been my uh, primary uh, resource whenever I had a question posed to me about the cult that I couldn't answer, which is quite often. And uh, he has uh, been very helpful uh, to a lot of students. In fact, 
the whole reason that this class came into being, for two reasons, is that um, last semester, some of you may know, that we had quite a few Jehovah's Witnesses start coming in here and asking questions. I know Gary Rome got twisted into a theological pretzel uh, when some Jehovah's Witnesses came through here and uh, uh, started questioning about the, the Trinity. And, uh, you know, he came to me and says, gosh, I, you know, they had some good questions and made up, brought up some good points about the Trinity, and I didn't really know how to answer them. And so I was a little bit of help to him, but my, my greatest help to him was putting him in touch with Larry. And uh, so for about a month last semester, uh, we laid uh, ambushes for people in the, in the Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> we would have them to come back to talk to Larry, or to, to Gary, and uh, little did they know that we had invited Larry along. So here was Larry with this stack of material, and, and they had been back. Um, but uh, and, and I'm always getting questions about Christians on campus, the Unification Church, and Hare Christians, and all these groups. So we just thought that it would be a good idea to have a class on the call. The other reason why we're having this is uh, uh, this is uh, kind of the uh, excuse the metaphor for the maiden voyage. <laughs> Or, uh, of this new room that we're in. Uh, this wasn't here last semester. And so this, we're kind of, uh, uh, this is the christening event for, for the, uh, the probe center. Yeah, let's get a bottle of champagne and break it over my head. Uh, for the probe center uh, study room. And I think uh, we want to make a lot more use of this uh, room in the future. So this is where all the classes will be held. That's enough of, <coughs> of my talking. I want to uh, introduce you now to uh, uh, Larry, and the only other thing I would like to have you do is uh, just uh, sign, uh, put your name here and uh, the uh, the phone number so I can uh, put you on a mailing list and, and solicit funds from you. <laughs> <laughs> no, just want to have a record of who's here, and I uh, appreciate that. That's the only cost involved really in doing it. Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> so, Larry, you want to go ahead and pass but uh, I'll go ahead and, uh, and open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful uh, for the many things that you've done for us. You created us in your image, and uh, though we were yet sinners, you sent your Son to die for us. You called us to yourself, and you are equipping us for service. You are forgiving us daily of our many sins, and uh, you have a place for us on this world and in the church. And, Lord, we just want to continue to, to search for what that purpose is. We thank you that uh, you have given us truth clearly, that we don't have to be geniuses to become Christians or to understand the Christian faith. And, uh, Lord, you tell us to contend earnestly for the faith, to be ready to give an answer, and to be able to respond wisely to any who approach us without any questions. And, uh, to that end, we are here tonight, and we just pray for Larry that you would guide him and enable him to teach us and, and help make us teachable as we uh, sit in on this uh, class. And Father, most of all, I pray that we would do something with it and that we would gain more of an understanding so that we can have more confidence and be better witnesses to truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to thank you, John, for invite me to come down here for that introduction and I want to thank all of y'all for coming out tonight. I'm kind of surprised I'm thinking it might only be one or two people at most here, you know, so it's exciting to see more people. There's not many people, amazingly enough, that are interested in this field, basically called Christian apologetics. Apologetics is uh, a word that uh, means strongly defending the faith. Uh, uh, Christian faith in this instance. That word is, uh, apologia is found in the Bible eight times in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul and other um, apostles of Christ tell their people to defend, to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. That's two, three. There's many other places. Uh, the scripture talks about the Christian should be always ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within them. Uh, sanctifying Christ as Lord in your hearts. And uh, I, I think you're all receiving a uh, lecture outline. I see that, uh, John, uh, yeah, yeah, you took mine. <laughs> I need one at least. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, 
there you go. Well, I've got it down, but it's, I just like to know what everyone else is looking at, you know, at the moment. <laughs> but I appreciate it. Thank you. As, uh, as we get started, I also uh, have a, a, a few other handouts and things I, I wanted to give. And I guess, John, I, if I could bother you to put you to work a little bit more. <laughs> we, we have uh, some basics here. Uh, this is an article I wrote for the Believer's God magazine years ago. It's on uh, it's cautioning uh, the Christian believers to uh, beware of false prophets. Uh, this magazine went out to over 100 different churches of different denominations. This is a non-denominational magazine. And uh, I was able to come in contact with quite a few ministers from different realms of Christianity. and. Uh, they all seem to like this particular article a lot, especially in helping their people uh, defend themselves against the cult. Now, I've got a few other handouts that we'll worry about at the end of the class, uh, which you might be interested in. Uh, I thought this would be a good one. A fulfilled prophecy is an apologetic uh, prophecy, in my opinion, is one of the great uh, apologetic tools that Christians can use to show the Bible has something going for it. You know, what's the difference uh, between the Bible and any other religion, but the, the other religions don't have the kind of prophecy that the Bible has, that's verifiable, along with archaeological evidence and so forth. Also, uh, what does the Bible teach about Scripture? Uh, like Martin Luther taught, uh, sola scriptura, uh, use only the Bible as your your uh, your standard for truth. Uh, that's where we're going to find out that a lot of cults, non-Christian or pseudo-Christian cults and religions always seem to add something else besides just the Bible. It has to be something else, either a word of knowledge from the prophet that they have or a new scripture or whatever. And then another one that you might find interesting here at the end of the class is called Patterns in the Cult. Now, we'll be talking about that today. But this is more in-depth, and it has a lot of quotations from actual cult groups on what they say about different doctrines and things that are pertaining to card cardinal Christian doctrines which we're going to get into here in just a minute. Uh, one last thing I'd like to talk about here is, uh, like uh, John said, uh, one of my, my mentors that really inspired me to get into this, this field of uh, Christian work was Dr. Walter Martin. And uh, with this passion, it was almost like losing a father last year. Now, what I'd like to start out with is, uh, following our outline here, this is a basic introduction to the, the culture, I'd say. Uh, the topic of which here is uh, who's that knocking on my door? Uh, as you see on the outline, we've got uh, false prophets and false doctrine. There's approximately 24 million people who have membership in anti-Christian or pseudo-Christian cults. Then you got another 60 million dabbling in the occult, either directly or indirectly. Uh, the occult being, you know, people playing with Ouija boards or going to palm readers, uh, astrology, you name it. I just Got in a big battle at work. My boss at work was the biggest. He, he cast horoscopes, and he didn't like an article I'd written on astrology, and uh, he came down on me. We had a good little discussion uh, uh, on that. You get, the minute you uh, you try to hold firm to what the Bible says, uh, you'll find you're going to get in a lot of trouble <laughs> with people. So you might as well get used to it right now. Uh, the Bible, if you get into it, is constantly dealing with false prophets. In fact, whole epistles and books of the Bible are written to counter what all these heretics and false prophets are saying to mislead the, the people. Uh, I don't have it here on the list, but uh, uh, a great passage, uh, if you have Bibles, I guess some of you do, uh, I'd like to turn you over to Matthew chapter 7 for a second, and we're going to kind of see what Jesus himself said about false prophets. And uh, we're looking at verse 15. Everyone's got it. I'm, I've got a King James version of the Bible. That's the only, uh, you know, I've got all the, uh, my, my favorite is the New American Standard version because it's the most, it's the most close to the original Greek there is. It sounds a little awkward in places, but the NIV is also good. But I use the King James wherever I go because the false prophets respect the King James Bible. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, the Jehovah's Witnesses, print King James versions of the Bible. So the Mormons 
uh, highly respect uh, King James. They have no respect at all for some of the other translations. So if you want to deal and talk with cults, cultists and stuff a lot of times, you ought to use the Bible version that they respect the most if you want to get a little more attention. Uh, a lot of times if you use a New American Standard or an NIV, they'll go, what's that? What is this? Some cult Bible? The New King James, you may be able to get get away with that because it's pretty close to the the uh, original. They, they, they modernized some of the passages to make it a little clearer and stuff. Uh, but, you know, for all purposes, I, I, I prefer to minimize controversy as much as possible because there's going to be controversy down the line, so might as well minimize some of it right away by just going with the Bible if they don't have any problems with it. <laughs> Uh, as you get into the, the, the King James Version and show them things, of course, they'll start having a lot of problems with it, but the key is they won't object to the version. And that's what you want, want to do now. But all that said, I'm reading uh, Matthew 7, 15 uh, here in the King James, and it says, this is Jesus talking, it says, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inward, inwardly they are ravaging wolves, or ravening wolves in King James. Uh, in other versions, it says savage wolves. And this is very, uh, this is very revealing to us because if, if you know anything about symbols in the Bible, Jesus symbolizes his people, his church, the body of Christ, as sheep. You know, we are the sheep of God, and Jesus is the good shepherd. Well, when he says here, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. Okay. He's telling you something right now about false prophets. He's telling you these false prophets look like sheep. They got sheep skin on. So they appear to be Christians or in the body of Christ. You run into a, a Mormon on the street and he says, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe he's God and I believe he rose from the dead. You know, Shed his blood. The, the Jehovah's Witness, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. You know, and all these other religious groups, Unity School, uh, Christian Science, uh, Reverend Moon people even pay with these things. So the terminology is the sheepskin. The sheepskin is that they say words that in the Christian mind he interprets to be Christian terminology, which, they, which it on the surface is. But what does he mean when, what does the Jehovah's Witness mean when he says Jesus Christ? What is, who is Jesus Christ to him? Or who is God? Or, or, or these other terms that all sound so beautiful, but actually his meaning and his terminology and his understanding of the word is completely different than what the standard Orthodox evangelical Christian would believe. You know, the Christian in his mind thinks Jesus Christ, second person of the Trinity. But to the Jehovah's Witness, when he says Jesus Christ, he's Michael the Archangel, who was recreated by Jehovah God to become Jesus the man who didn't become the Christ until he was baptized on his 30th birthday. Then when he was crucified, he ceased to exist. His body evaporated into gases. And then Jehovah God recreated him as Michael the Archangel. So Jesus Christ no longer exists. But uh, you see, it's a completely different Jesus. And as you get that in, uh, I believe now, I'm not a computer bank here, but uh, I think it's in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 uh, where Paul says there's another Jesus, another gospel, uh, another spirit. So the Bible itself says there's other Jesuses, other gospels, other spirits. And when people just use the name Jesus, what I usually say is, well, which one? You believe in Jesus, but which one? You know, and that usually freaks them out for a minute. What do you mean, which one? There's only one. You know? Well, you tell me who it is that Jesus, who, who Jesus represents to you. Tell me all about them. And uh, then you can find out what they mean when they say Jesus Christ. And it gets to be uh, pretty interesting after that. And or it's just on a, a general witnessing thing. Most people say they believe in God. You can have fun saying, well, well who is God? You know, and they... And then you, you see people just uh, bumbling and stumbling around trying to come up with what they think of God or who he is. And you find out very quickly the God they believe in is not the God of the Bible. And then you can start gently and reverently witnessing to them 
who the God of the Bible really is as God gives the opportunity. So what we have here and on your outline, you, you see uh, you see like uh, how many people are, are in it, about 84 million, actually more than that, because these are kind of old statistics now. Uh, the reason for false prophets and religions, I think that's the uh, passage I just was trying to uh, mention a, a minute ago, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, you see that, chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid from them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Okay, that wasn't the one I was talking about before, but this shows you why false prophets and religions exist because the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Okay. And then I have throughout here in, in part C the, the false prophet threats throughout the Bible. We're not going to go through all these uh, for lack of time, but uh, you have this as a reference. You've got Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 through 5. I mention these for the sake of the tape. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, almost the whole chapter there, that's when uh, uh, Elijah is dealing with the false prophets of Baal and they go up on Mount Carmel and they're going to decide who's the real God here. Uh, if, uh, if that current, uh, what is it, Rel uh, relativism existed, well, it doesn't matter what you believe. Every, you know, we, we're all just worshiping the same God in a different way. Well, it sure didn't seem that way in 1 Kings 18 where uh, Elijah showed up the uh, false prophets of Baal and promptly uh, slew them at the end of it. And then you have uh, Jeremiah 14, 14 through 16, Ezekiel 13, 2 through 3, 6 through 9. I believe here Ezekiel, uh, in Ezekiel 14, 10 uh, gives one of the most chilling things that runs up my spine. He says the punishment of the false prophet and the punishment of the follower of the false prophet will be the same punishment. So you can have all these sincere people in these cults. And they're sincere and they really believe what they're in. That's why you should never attack someone and just call them, you're silly, you're dumb, you're crazy, you know, you're just a false prophet. You know, so these people are sincere about their faith. They don't know that they're getting ripped off by a false prophet. They're being led astray. They're being deceived. So uh, that's why... Uh, when we realize, like in Ezekiel, that the punishment of these sincere followers is going to be the same as that lying false prophet. That's when we need to remember what Jude says near the end of uh, that epistle. And Jude, uh, we need to snatch them out of the fire as God gives them opportunity. We should try to witness them in love to show them the true way of salvation biblically. Okay, and also following on Isaiah 30, uh, verses 9 through 11, 2 Timothy chapter 4, 3 and 4, Acts chapter 20, verses 29 through 31, and as you know, Colossians and 1 John deal mainly with uh, refuting Gnostic heresies, and Gnostics are a lot like uh, the mind science cults of the day, Christian science, Unity School of Christianity, uh, the mind science of uh, Ernest Holmes, and all the rest of the New Age type of cults. Now, I do want to look at one thing here that shows you... One thing here in Acts chapter 20, I do want to look at that and just show you the two types of false prophets there are. The Bible tells us fairly clearly in Acts 20, flip it over here, and uh, in verse 29, he says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wool enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Once again, we get that... Uh, relationship to Matthew 7:15 that we just read a minute ago about wolves and sheep's clothing. Here, here are these wolves are going to come in, not sparing a flock, the flock of God, of course, verse 30. Also of your own self shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one of, to warn everyone day and night with tears. For three years he warned about all these false prophets. They're going to come and try to lead them astray. And here he outlines the two types. You've got grievous wolves who are coming in among them. That's like people that are outside of the Orthodox Christian community. Let's say, you know, you can recognize the Jehovah's Witness. He's coming from outside the Orthodox Christian church. You can recognize Mormons. You can recognize all these people that are outside the Christian church, uh, pretending to be Christians or whatever. But then he says, 
down here in verse 30, also of your own self shall men arise. So now he's warning there's also men that are going to come from inside the church, inside the Baptist church, inside the Presbyterian church or the Methodist church or the Assemblies of God church or whatever it may be. There'll be false prophets coming from inside the church, false prophets coming from outside the church. So those are two types, in and out. Uh, what we want to do is, in the providence of God is make them down and out. But uh, anyway, <laughs> that, uh, the problem here is like uh, there was a big thing in the ni- late 1960s, the God is dead uh, uh, theology that popped up. You know where that came from? Mm-hmm. Where? Mm-hmm. Nietzsche? Well, yeah, he taught that, but I'm talking about it didn't. I mean, he, he taught it years earlier. I mean, Hitler picked up on that and everything else. But... Uh, the God is Dead theology it was so big and Playboy magazine was putting up big articles about it and everything and there's debates all over the, the United States and it was appearing in major newspapers it was it came out by uh, Thomas J. Altizer and he was a seminary professor he was a seminary professor at uh, a Baptist seminary in New York uh, I think the name of the center was Rochester but uh, this man was teaching this nationwide as a professor of a seminary where they teach Baptist men to be pastors or whatever. And so that's just one example of what, what can happen here. Uh, God is dead, uh, coming right out of a, a Baptist seminary. And as you go to many seminaries uh, nowadays, uh, most uh, a lot of Bible-believing uh, pastors call them cemeteries. <laughs> because when you get into the major cemeteries, <laughs> I almost did it myself, <laughs> Seminaries, they, they tell you, well, Moses didn't write the first bi- five books of, uh, of the Bible, you know, the Pentateuch. It was uh, this uh, Graf Bellhausen hypothesis that said it was uh, somebody else wrote this and someone else wrote that. And, and uh, Daniel didn't write Daniel in 570 B.C. or whatever it was. He wrote it much later to account for all those prophecies in there, you know. He wrote it after the fact. And, and uh, you, you know, you go to most seminaries today, and that's exactly what they're going to be doing. They'll uh, be destroying the faith or people's actual belief system in the in the Bible and what it has to say. I was at the atheist convention a couple years ago at the Wyndham Hotel. I like to go to I like to go to conventions. You know, I, I went to the Jehovah's Witness convention at the Astrodome and Mormon uh, ward meetings and uh, Christian. I like to hang out in Christian Science reading rooms. So it, it, it's, it's a fun life, but. Uh, in this particular case, I went to uh, the Wyndham Hotel. It was their National Atheist Convention. Uh, I've got pictures of it here, Dan. I should have bought them. <laughs> but uh, uh, I got talking with the editor of the American Atheist Magazine, uh, the, the guy that publishes that national or international uh, magazine. And I asked him, well, how did you become an atheist? And he, he was uh, telling me a few things. He said, well, when I was a young boy, I had this strong belief in God. I came out of a Lutheran church. And when I got old enough out of high school, after I graduated high school, I wanted to go to a Lutheran uh, uh, Bible college and then you know, seminary and everything like that. So he went to one of these places, and he got there, and he said, all I ever did there was tell me Moses didn't write Moses, Isaiah was written by two different people, and all these other things that, you know, you couldn't believe the Bible. And he said, the, the, my, my Bible college education destroyed my faith in God and in the Bible. And from there, I just became an atheist, and here I am now, the editor of American Atheist Magazine. So uh, you, you get this kind of thing going on. Uh, it, it's amazing, but uh, true. Now, as we go on here uh, to point number two, we got Christians should contend for the faith. I mentioned before Jude 3, uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, that's basically study to show thyself approved, the workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, we should be studying and learning. First Peter 3.15 is kind of the flagship verse for what I do. To every man an answer for the hope that lies within you. Uh, most of these scriptures are, are spelled out in that little article on false prophets I gave you near the beginning or somewhere. But these are all... Uh, very good scriptures and what the Christians are called on by scripture to answer the cult, to answer people's questions. They don't have to necessarily be a cultist. They can be anybody with a sincere question. You should be there to, if you don't know the answer, 
tell them, well, I tell you what, I don't know right now, but let me get back with you and I'll get the answer. And, and that's basically how I got started in this ministry. I remember when I first got saved, I'm on, you know, your honeymoon period with Christ. And you're all going, oh, and you're telling all your friends and your relatives and they're all getting mad at you because they think you freaked out and everything. Uh, but it was funny, the most people that wanted to talk to me about religion all the time, because uh, most people didn't want to talk to me about religion, but the people that did want to talk to me when I was during this honeymoon period, just a newborn in Christ, we're cultists. I mean, Jehovah's Witnesses love talking with me and, the, and the Mormons and all these people. And they would come at me with all these weird doctrines. And I'd go, wow, you know, I don't know. But let me do some research because at least I had one, one, one thing at my disposal of Christian bookstores. I knew where they were. And I would go, you know, just to help answer this guy's question because I didn't know the answer, you know. And I'd go look it up and then get back with the guy. Just trade phone numbers or, or do whatever I had to to get back with a guy and, and try to answer his question and we dialogue some more, you know. Because uh, when I start hearing these crazy things, I think, man, <laughs> what's that? And so that's uh, what you can do. And it was just kind of nice later to find throughout Scripture that we are called to answer people's questions about our faith and, uh, you know, refute, like it says in uh, Titus 1.9, you know, refute the gangsayers, you know. Yeah. That's one of, the, one of my favorites. But you're wrong, but you have to do it in a loving way. Nice way. So, uh, we'll get into that. Okay, now as we go on through here, uh, this is too kind time consuming to cover now. This could take more than an hour just to talk about this. So I'm going to bypass this. I can understand the Trinity. Okay, you basically the Trinity is within the nature of the one God or three eternally distinct persons. See, these, this essential Christian doctrine is heavily attacked. The Jehovah's Witnesses, the ones that are coming here to the Probe Center, they have those little things they're printing up nowadays, why believe the Trinity? You know, and it's just a, a, a magazine that just attacks the Trinity like you wouldn't believe. And for someone that's not biblically grounded well, this thing would just tear them up, you know. And I remember uh, walking in here that one day and a couple of the probe centers too said, Larry, how do you, what do you do with this, you know? <laughs> you know, I was just coming in for a minute to drop something off, and I was, I was there for 45 minutes just trying to answer all these attacks, and, you know, we still weren't through. I had to go, and I was worried about getting a parking ticket. But anyway, so as you can see from the outline here, I'm just going to run over. The scripture verses are all there. The Trinity, you know, the Trinity raises Jesus from the dead. There is one God. Because there is one God, the scripture makes it clear. Uh, we can see that the Bible also teaches the Father is God, Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and, but there is one God. So within the nature of the one God, there are three distinct persons. This, of course, as uh, I there says, Satan attacks the truth of the Trinity. Since God has revealed himself as the blessed Trinity, Satan must deny it through counterfeit religions and false prophets. So what you'll end up with a lot of times dealing with these cults, is the nature of God. They'll, you know, Jehovah's Witness will insist that Jesus is not God. He's the Archangel Michael. He's a created being. And they've got a ton of pro proof text. It's just like uh, John was mentioning earlier, turn you into a doctrinal pretzel, blow your mind. <laughs> They'll quote Revelation 3.14, Colossians 1.15, John 14.28. I've dealt with them long enough to know the verses, but uh, we'll get into them next week. That's <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, but all these cults will do this. But you know, Satan's yeah. More into the Trinity next week. Yeah, if you like, you know, it's just due to time. Yeah. You know? uh, uh, but you know, Satan is a great counterfeiter, as it says in uh, I think it's, once again Second uh, Second Corinthians chapter eleven says his ministers clothe themselves as angels of Right, or as uh, workers of righteousness and angels of light. He, he even masquerades as an angel of light himself. And so he is not original. Satan can't really create anything. God is the creator. So when he deals with, let's say, the Trinity, really, he can't really create anything. All he can really basically do is deny it. And that's, <laughs> that's what these cults are really doing. They're just kind of like uh, apostles of denial. I think you even have that book by Edmund Gress in there. So good title. But anyway, we'll, we'll get into that at another time. Probably uh, we'll get into it some with the Jehovah's Witnesses because that's really their big attack point. They like to go after people that believe in the Trinity and they try to make you look like some pagan idolater for believing in the Trinity. And uh, they've, got a plenty, they, they've got plenty of stuff 
their arm with to uh, mess you up good. So that's why the Bible, and as we read before in Acts 20, Paul constantly warned with tears for three years to watch out for these guys. And, and in Timothy, you're, he told you to know that scripture, be a workman need, that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you got to be a workman. you got to study. you got to be prepared. Okay, now we're going to go on here to the next section, section four, what is a cult? And uh, basically it comes from the Latin word cultus, meaning, quote, a group of followers. You know, it's kind of a, a, a neutral term that doesn't really, you know, it's not really meant to be a negative term. It's just a, a word that means a group of followers. Now, we're going to make it negative in the sense that we're trying to distinguish between this cult, this group of followers from orthodox denominations. You've got, you know, your Lutherans, Methodists, whatever. And to show a distinction, we say cult. This is a quick, easy term to distinguish the difference between the Christians here and these that claim to be Christians but are really those Matthew 7 15 types okay right down here uh, here we go with my uh, my mentor dr. Walter Martin uh, he uh, he says I'll just read right off the page here he says a cult is a group of people polarized around someone's interpretation of the Bible it always claims to be in accord with the Bible but always ends up denying essential biblical teachings, particularly the fact that God became man in Jesus Christ. And of course, the other one there is from Jay Adams, an author, he says, I kind of like that, it says, a cult is organized heresy, <laughs> which is uh, pretty true. Uh, it's like Walter Martin there says, uh, these cults, they, they polarize around some cult leader. Somebody just starts his own religion, take... Uh, uh, L. Ron Hubbard of Scientology, you know, in 1949 at a, uh, a science fiction writer's convention, because he was a big time science fiction writer back in the 40s and the 30s, very popular, uh, but he's having financial trouble late in the 40s, and he said, you know, the best way to make a million dollars is to start your own religion. Well, lo and behold, the next year he writes Dianetics, and it catches on big time, sells hundreds of thousands of copies, and then he starts his own religion, in 1952, most most uh, people say 54, but the the uh, core and all the origins, the roots and whatever of Scientology were started in 52 as a religion, and then he just moved it right on up. And that also got him out of trouble with uh, the IRS and uh, the medical profession, which was attacking his Dianetics book for being unmedical and un unsafe for people to follow. Uh, but when he can claim it's a religion, you know, then they can't touch him under the, the Constitution and all the amendments or whatever else. So uh, that's just one case. Uh, a man just starts a religion and they say, you know, uh, people start worshiping God. You've got Botswana, Sri Rodnish. You know, the, the Sri in his name means Sir God. People get these gurus that they think are God and they center around him and they believe all his teachings. And, you know, he's like an avatar, of, you know, an ascended master that's incarnated in a human body and he's giving all these scriptural truths and you got uh, other cult leaders I, I would you know the Jehovah's Witness started by Charles Taz Russell in 1879 of course now they've got what's called a governing body and in that case in their case it's not so much just one man although it was started by one man now it's an organization the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society the people in the Jehovah's Witness are centered around this this organizational structure in Brooklyn New York so it's not like they're following just one man. It's this organization in this big building up there that tells them everything they're to believe. And uh, everyone else is wrong, and they're the only one that have the truth, even though uh, their truth changes all the time. <laughs> but uh, And so it doesn't necessarily have to be one man. It could be a group of men or, or a big organization or something. But uh, that's what basically uh, we're, for our purposes, defining a cult as a, uh, a group of people polarized around someone's Interpretation, interpretation of the Bible, but of course they always hold that Bible in their hand. So they they say they believe the Bible, they've got a Bible in their hand, but yet they're not Christians and they, and they don't really believe the Bible. Uh, and we're going to find out why here in a minute, but it's kind of shocking because I've found that uh, 
it, it, and this ought to stir every Christian's heart to see people perishing, perishing with Bibles in their hands. You know, they got the Bible right in their hand. This is the way of salvation. It tells you all about Christ and the cross and all that, and people are dying in their sins with this Bible in their hand because some false prophet has distorted the word where they aren't seeing it clearly. So anyway, let's take a look now with our remaining time uh, at the marks of a cult. Once again, like I said at the start of the class, I've got this little handout here that, that says patterns in a cult, and you're all free to grab that too. But uh, like I just mentioned, and this, I, I kind of just now took care of this, uh, point one here is a central authority figure, and that's just what I expanded on a second ago, so you understand that. Uh, two, it attacks the Orthodox Christian Church. The Christian Church has been established since the first century, the early church writings of Athanasius, Origen, Polycarp, all the way back. Uh, you've got the creeds, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed, the, 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 the creeds that came down from Chalcedon. You've got all these historic statements of the Christian faith. That was mainly put there to attack, you know, to fight off the uh, false prophets who were saying other things. And they said, well, man, we're going to write something down. So this is what Christianity stands for. And so we've got all these creeds of Christendom. Well, when these cults get created and they, they start up and they have these new weird doctrines, one of the first things they have to do, since their doctrine is not the same as the historic Christian doctrine that goes back to the first century, they have to say, well, you know, that Nicene Creed, that's, that was put together by a bunch of false prophets back there in the third century. Or, or uh, you know, th these are all heretics back here. They came up with these doctrines. And, and they've been wrong. Like Herbert W. Armstrong, he just goes right and says, I'm prophesied in the book of Revelation. He's that old man. that He died about four years ago, but you may have remembered him. Uh, Herbert W. Armstrong is the Plain Truth magazine and all that. Uh, but he said, the church has been in total apostasy for the last uh, 19 time cycles. What he means by that is uh, it's been, you know, there's been no truth since the first century when the apostles were here. And since then, everybody's been apostate, and there's been no true religion until he got here. And now he's preaching what they preached 1,900 years ago. You know? And that's what a lot of these cults do. The Mormons do it. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses say there's been a few out there, but most of them were led astray by the Nicene Creed and all that kind of stuff. Well, anyway, so they're going to be attacking the Christian church and its beliefs because obviously their beliefs aren't the same. So they've got to attack the authority of the historic Christian church. Okay, and then point three there it says employs semantic double things. And I touched on this a little bit a minute ago when I said, uh, you say Jesus Christ to somebody. You say it to a Mormon. And he says, yes, I believe in Jesus. Christ. I also believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I believe Jesus died on a cross. I believe he shed his, his blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, and uh, I uh, believe he rose from the dead. You know, it all sounds great, right? But of course, when he says he believes in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, he believes, what he's really saying is he believes that there's three different gods. There's God the Father, who, if, if you go with, you know, see, they've got a lot of distens dissension here, because uh, one of their uh, people, uh, uh, it was a Brigham, Brigham Young. There we go. They got a pretty good football team, but uh, I, I wouldn't care much for his doctrine. But, but in a Journal of Discourses, uh, Volume 1, page 50, and it's right over here in Perry Castaneda Library because I've done the research, looked up a lot of the Mormon writings. Also over here in the Harry Ransom Center, they've got uh, an 1855 Book of Mormon over there. I mean, the, a the actual one. Of course, uh, they don't tell you they've made over 4,000 changes in it since it was first published back then. <laughs> but uh, that's another story. Uh, but Brigham Young said uh, that God the Father was Adam. I mean, if, you know, if you don't believe me, you go to Procrastinate Of course, y'all listening on the tape won't be able to see that. But, but anyway, uh, in his doctrine, the Father was Adam, who, you know, had committed the sin in the Garden of Eden with Eve, and he died, and he became an ascended God of this planet. And according to Brigham Young's teaching, then Adam, God, came down and had sex with the Virgin Mary, and then Mary had a child who was Jesus, you see. And Jesus, before he was born in this sexual relationship between Adam, God, and Mary, was the spirit brother of the devil in heaven. 
But anyway, I, we'll get into all this in a couple of weeks with El Mormon, okay? But you see what we're talking about here on semantic double. You say Jesus Christ, you think second person of the Trinity, you know, Jesus, God the Son, you know, worship, creator. I mean, he made all things, John 1, 3, you know. Uh, but they are thinking something completely different. So that's why I always say, well, who is it? What do you think of Christ? That's what Jesus asked in uh, Matthew 16. Who do the people say that I, the Son of Man, am? You know, and they possibly gave him all kinds of different answers. But uh, the key there is that's what you're up against in the kingdom of the cult. Double thing. So you always have to define your terms. What do you mean by that? Okay? As time flies. We're going to get into another thing here. Next point. Uh, cults distort the Bible. You know, like I just said a minute ago, they, they're they holding the Bible in their hand and say they believe the Bible. They, they say our teachings are what the Bible says. And uh, the problem, of course, is, as we see in there, uh, right under that, uh, point one, the interpretation their interpretation of what the Bible says is the problem. You can sit with a cultist, like I have for hours, for years, with different people, and you can show them point-blank scriptures that totally refute what they're saying, but they are convinced that, no, your interpretation is wrong. I don't know how, how it is, but I know this Watchtower Society has got the truth here, and their interpretation supersedes yours because you're of the devil. And so your interpretation is not correct. Uh, they are, you might almost say, it's almost like a brainwashing that takes place in a lot of the cults. They are brainwashed into believing certain doctrines, and it's almost like they can't see at all what the scripture says uh, in, in, in regards to what, whatever it happens you happen to be talking about. And that gets back to where I was talking about before, how Satan, the god of this world, has blinded the mind of them that believe not. And you'll be amazed how you can show what looks to be just point blank, concise, clear, biblical doctrine and teaching that nobody can miss. And it's like the person, is, he's got blinders on his eye. He can't see it at all. And you can try every way and he just, he just can't see it. The problem is he's got a plank in his eye. And the plank is that false prophet who's given him an interpretation that he accepts more than anything else. And uh, that's why a lot of people, a lot of Christians that are dealing with cults, they get all frustrated. They say, I, these people are impossible to talk with. But when you understand, like it says in Second Corinthians, or First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, it says, a natural man uh, cannot understand the things of God, neither can he know them, for they're spiritually discerned. See, when you've got the Holy Spirit and you're trying to show spiritual things, he can't possibly understand it without the Holy Spirit. That's why we have to go that extra two or three miles to try to work with a man or whoever it may be to help them understand these things because uh, too often Christians just give up and they wring their hands and they say, ah, oh, this guy's impossible and they get all frustrated. Don't do that. You have to understand that they're blinded. You have to come to them in love and things of this nature. So I'm going to have to hurry along here. Okay, and the other part is they corrupt the text. I put scripture references on there. Of course, uh, on point one, interpretation, in 2 Peter 3.16 talks about how they risk the scriptures to their own destruction. And Revelation 22, 18 and 19 talks about how people either add to the text or take away the text. And in the case of Jehovah's Witnesses, they come out with their own Bible and they just, they just pervert it like crazy. Everywhere the Bible disagrees with their set doctrine, they change it. <laughs> it's as simple as that. They just change it. We'll get into that next week. They just change of the Bible. The Mormons came out with the inspired version of the Bible. It was the King James Bible. And what it was is Joseph Smith went through the King James Bible and just added or took out whatever he felt like. And he went from the Genesis all the way to Revelation. And when he got through, voila, he's got an inspired version of the Bible. Of course, uh, when I dealt with Mormon missionaries and, and, and Mormons, and I showed them references out of the Joseph Smith inspired version that disagrees with there are other Mormon doctrines, they they shovel it off just like they do anything else. Because uh, one thing about Mormonism, we'll find out, they've got all kinds of problems because they've got four references, and they all contradict it with each other. And so you can, you know, instead of them making you into a doctrinal pretzel, you can do, do it with Mormon theology to them if you're 
familiar with it. And hopefully by showing this contradiction, they can see the, that maybe this didn't come from God after all. Because God's not the author of confusion. Now, uh, I'm going to have to really raise because I can see John kind of squir squirming in his chair over there. So I'll just kind of move right along here. Uh, cult pattern of revelation goes from error to truth. Deuteronomy 18 talks about false prophets that say something in God's name and then it doesn't come to pass. Uh, case in point here, just quickly, is uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses. They predicted the end of the world in 1879, 1914, 1918, 1925, 1975. And the last Jehovah's Witness we had here at the Probe Center were telling me 1999 would be the end. They didn't say it specifically 1999, but they were saying within 10 years, you know, and uh, as it is, it's in their uh, Watchtower magazine, they are now predicting that 1999, I think I wrote it down here somewhere, so I'll wait until next week and tell you where those references are in the Watchtower magazine. <laughs> uh, but uh, the thing is, they're always talking about, well, we made an error here, but now we've got the truth. You know, they they changed their doctrines. Uh, they used to say you can worship Jesus, but now... You can't worship Jesus, but then they change that to now when you give them relative worship, but then they said relative worship is idolatry. Uh, uh, so, you know, they got shifting doctrines and they got changing dates. And so, but always at this present moment, this is the truth. You know, uh, they were wrong a while ago. Yeah, we were wrong, but now we've got the truth. So, what's always happening is they're in their revelation, they're going from, uh, you know, error to truth. They always. Always have new truth, or as they, Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witnesses call it, new life. And uh, uh, I'll save. I've got a good joke in that one. I'll save that for next week. Uh, <laughs> so, as we know from biblical revelation, it always the Bible was given over by forty uh, different authors, six six different books over a period of fifteen hundred years, and it's progressive revelation. In other words, the Bible never contradicts with itself. It's always giving more revelation, shedding more and more light, focusing in on the central person that's our life, Jesus Christ. You know, and we get that in the Bible, but in the cult, it's always the reverse. They always have all this error, and they're always supposedly having new truth, but then tomorrow, they say, oh, we, we were wrong yesterday. Now today, this is the truth. You know? Anyway, that's what all that means. Uh, quickly moving along, uh, false verification of the cult. Uh, a lot of times they like to vindicate themselves, say, we've got the truth, because we're the only ones that go around not door to door, giving this meat and due season. We're the only ones uh, sharing the gospel in the neighborhoods or whatever, and our, you know we lead clean up, upstanding lives. Or something. They always have some reason why they're true, you know. But usually it's just false, false stuff. Because then you can always mention other things that just seem to kind of indicate, well, other people do that too, and they're not your religion. <laughs> but uh, anyway, then uh, they always employ salvation by works, and as you see clearly there, a cult usually has faith plus works equals salvation, whereas the Bible clearly teaches that faith equals salvation plus work. When you're truly saved, you're not saved because of any works you do. You know, you're not, uh, you're not earning any brownie points with God for doing the things you do. I mean, of course, John does a great job here, but I doubt if this is earning his salvation by working at the Pro Center helping Christians too. You know, he's already saved, and he's doing this out of his love for Christ. Why any Christian does his good works is because he loves Christ and he wants to live for him. So uh, that's a, a basic difference there. And, of course, we all know about financial exploitation. <laughs> uh, makes us wonder about some of these TV evangelists at the same time. But anyway, uh, just quickly moving on to the last point here, major point. It says, how can Christians make a strong defense of the gospel of Christ and indeed share it with cultists and others? And... Uh, of course, uh, letter A there is very important. Know why you believe what you believe. And you have Second Timothy chapter two verse fifteen, which talks again about being a you know study to show thyself approved, or when it needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know you need to know why you believe what you believe. I mean, it's, it's silly to go around. Well, I had a guy at work the other day. Uh, he, he was sitting there telling me, well, you've got to believe in the Bible. You've got to believe in God. And I said, well, you know, who's God and what does the Bible say? Well, he says, well, I don't know, but the guy at my church says that's what you should believe. And I said, 
are you serious? You expect me to believe you and you don't even know what you believe? <laughs> of course, he was, you know, with the, I could go on for another five minutes on that conversation, but uh, he was obviously saw the point of how are you going to convince anybody else when you don't know your position yourself? Uh, there's just no way. And, of course, that flies in the face of what the Scripture teaches us anyway. We're supposed to learn. You know? Okay, then uh, point B here, uh, the Christian apologist, or you know, as we know from before, the word of uh, uh, apologetics, and stuff. it means defender of the faith, or defense of the Christian faith, the, uh, the Christian apologist must, one, lead a holy life in the sight of God. The scriptures are there. I mean, if you're living like the devil, <laughs> it's not going to be, you know, doing apologetics or trying to share your faith with Christ is going to accomplish a whole lot. Uh, two, grow in the knowledge of God's Word. Of course, we have to, that was the name of my, uh, my uh, column in a Christian uh, magazine, uh, the two-edged sword. That's Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. You know, dividing asunder, the bone and the marrow, that's, that's the sword of the Spirit. Use the Word of God. You know, the way you use it is to know it. <laughs> you got to know it. Okay, uh, three, you have to pray for God's wisdom. The scriptures are there. Uh, always, whatever you're doing, even while you're witnessing, in the act of witnessing, uh, I've always been praying to God. When the cultist is telling me stuff, I always listen. A lot of times, I know what he's saying, and I'll just pray to God. Lord, please give me the verse or the answer you'd like me to have to help this person. You know, you can pray anywhere, anytime. Okay. Uh, four, share with gentleness and reverence. The scriptures are there, very clear. Uh, have a good conscience uh, about what you're doing. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, your, your, your religion is a ripoff and just a cult. You know, and you insult the person. What have you done immediately? You cut them off. You're not going to listen to you anymore. You come across like you're closed-minded and you're not going to hear them out. The key is to be like the Scripture says. Be gentle, long-suffering, patient, kind. And uh, we'll get into that right now. Let's see. The dues of witnessing for Christ. you got to, one, a scale of semantic barrier. That's where I said before you had to divine, define the terms. What do you mean when you say Jesus? What do you mean when you say God? What do you mean when you say the Holy Spirit? Uh, what do you mean by all these things? You know, not viciously, but just ask them politely. Uh, and then have them tell you, then you can respond to them in a biblical way. Okay, a recognized cultist is a person made in the image of God, not a monster. <laughs> so many people, one guy was telling me the other day how he was so proud of his mom because she threatened a Jehovah's Witness at her door with a shotgun. So that's one way to get rid of those cultists. I said, well, <laughs> I said that's not the biblical way, though. <laughs> You know, you can scare them off with a shotgun, but all they're doing is they're still going to have their faith. They're going to feel pumped up because they were persecuted for Christ's sake. And they were serving Jehovah's kingdom by suffering this persecution. And they're going to go out even more determined to share that false gospel with somebody else. See, it hadn't done anybody any good because they're out there still preaching false gospel. So you, you, uh, you, know, you have to realize this person... Is made in the image of God, and we should be trying to reach them and never treat them like dirt. Or and these people are sincere, you know. They, uh, you don't. They're not false prophets because they think they're false prophets. You don't walk up and say, "Hey, are you a false prophet?" Uh, they're they're going to say no, you know, because they they wouldn't be doing what they're doing if they they, they knew they were false prophets. Uh, reminds me of a joke. A lady asked a uh, she I mentioned at one of my other talks that uh, some group was a cult and. She comes back and chews me out and rebukes me in the name of Jesus and says, well, they aren't a false prophets because I went and asked them if they were false prophets and they said no. <laughs> yeah, of course they're going to say no, right? <laughs> but anyway, that's just something else. Let me get on here. Uh, uh, always, this is very important, point three, listen to what the cultist has to say. It's a two-way street. If you want the cultist to listen to you, you got to listen to them. You got to hear them out. You got to hear what they have to say about things. You don't just shut them off and, and try to jump in on everything they say. They say five words. They say, "Well, you're wrong because of this." You're wrong. You know, you have to let them say everything, no matter how whatever absurd it may be to you or whatever. You let them speak their piece, and when they're through, then you come back with you know scriptural references. Okay, down here. Uh, Number four, very important, also exhaust every effort to answer the questions of the sincere cultist. Uh, always try to answer questions, like I said before, if you can't, just say, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll get back with you. I can't answer this right now. 
you know, but give me a little time. I'll do some research and I'll try to come back and, and see if I can answer that question for you. So don't ever just throw people off. Okay, uh, and of course, five, be loving and patient during encounters. It's very important, you know. You don't want to cut the person off. You're trying to witness Christ to them. And when you come off vindictive or hateful or whatever, it just doesn't work. Okay, uh, six, gently refute cardinal errors of cult. Uh, you know, you won't be able to do all that in one night. We spent four hours with my two doctrines with the Jehovah's Witnesses last time we were here, for instance. Uh, sometimes you don't get into every possible thing there is. I always say centralizing the key thing. We're arguing with the Jehovah's Witness about hell is worthless. Because if I believe in hell or not, is not going to get me saved? I can believe in hell and still deny that Jesus is God or deny salvation uh, through his shed blood. And, you know, I'll, I'll get to see hell personally, but uh, believing that it exists doesn't save me. Believing in the person of Christ saves me. So argue about what's really important in the Christian faith, essential doctrine. Okay, and quickly the don'ts. Don't preach at cultists, cultists. Don't have a spiritual chip on your shoulder. You know, like you're looking down your nose at them with a superiority complex. Don't dodge questions. Don't lose your patience and get frustrated. Don't assume all cultists can be reached by the same methodology. Don't show obvious disrespect to cultists, beliefs, or leaders. So uh, with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, I appreciate you coming out to hear me tonight. And uh, if you like some of these flyers and things, feel free to take them. And thank you again, John, for having me out here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think you can uh, see that uh, Larry is not only knowledgeable, but has just a tad bit of enthusiasm for this, and I, it's infectious, and I, I thank God for it. And uh, <clears throat> as I was sitting back there and looking at the back of your head, I was uh, very thankful that you, each of you took time out to come tonight, because I know that there were probably some other things uh, that you could have justified doing. And uh, I also... Uh, got very excited to think that uh, if you take the time, and it does take time and effort, and uh, we like immediate gratification, or we like the path of least resistance, so it's not always easy to study. But if you were just to study this outline and uh, commit as, as much of it to memory and study these scriptures, um, uh, and then pray for opportunities as you go about in, uh, your lives here on campus and, and after you graduate. Uh, the kingdom is going to be a lot fuller because of that. And uh, so I want to thank you all for coming tonight. We hope you've enjoyed and benefited from the preceding message. Christian Answers has many more resources available, whether audio cassette, video, or written literature. For a free resource list, please write Christian Answers, Post Office Box 144441, Austin, Texas, 78714 or call 218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Remember, 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify in your hearts Christ as Lord, being ready always to give answer to every man that asketh you a reason concerning the hope that is in you, yet with meekness and fear. Christian Answers offers many resources. Have you ever wondered about the creation versus evolution controversy? Christian Answers offers video and audio cassettes on this subject, many featuring Dr. Michael Gerard of the Institute for Creation Research. And again, if a meteor hit the Earth, why would it just selectively kill the dinosaurs? Um, if the dust covered the Earth and it made it so dark that the dinosaurs died, uh, you would expect all the plants to die long before the dinosaurs died. So if we had mass extinction of dinosaurs, uh, because of a meteor, we should have had mass extinction of everything. There's nothing selective about dinosaurs dying because of meteorite poisoning. What's another theory? Oh, the theory I was taught in, in school, and this is absolutely true, Dr. Hank Ziller, uh, when I was in college, taught the theory that there was a plant which acted like a laxative uh, which became extinct. Now, when this laxative plant all died out, the dinosaurs couldn't get their laxative. If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022.
or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater. Please check out our YouTube channel page, C Answers TV. That's C A N S W E R S T V. Just type it into the YouTube search box, then click on one of our links for it. Our channel page features 19 playlists on all types of subjects, such as Jehovah's Witnesses with 17 videos. And by the way, these are videos we've produced ourselves. Mormonism, 14 videos. Seventh-day Adventism, 11 videos. Phony TV Preachers and King James Onlyites, 14 videos. Nation of Islam, Black Muslims, this is of the Louis Farrakhan type, 20 videos. God-hating atheists, agnostics, and know-it-alls, 18 videos. Darwin's Metaphysical Evolution Religion, 17 videos. UFOs, ghosts, magic, spiritual warfare, 16 videos. Islam, such as Sunni Muslims, Shiite Muslims, Alawite, Sufis, 54 videos. Roman Catholicism, Idolatry and the Virgin Mary, 71 videos. Anti-Trinitarian, such as the United Pentecostal Church and Church History, 36 videos. Antichrist cults, the New Age and World Religions, 38 videos. Saved by Works, Baptism, Church of Christ, Campbellism, 69 videos. Hell, Lake of Fire, Unpopular Bible Doctrines, 19 videos. Predestination, Arminianism, and Calvinism, 54 videos. End Times, Supernatural Prophecies, and Tough Bible Questions, 20 videos, and others. Our videos are free to the viewing public. If you'd like to be immediately notified of our latest uploaded videos, then please subscribe to our C Answers TV YouTube channel. If you have an existing YouTube account, then simply click on the subscribe button at the top of our channel page next to our ministry name, Christian Answers of Austin, Texas. If you don't have a YouTube account, then it is easy to set one up at no cost. Just search YouTube, then the YouTube opening page will appear, and to the left-hand side will be a blue button saying Create Account. Click on that and follow the instructions. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas. Christian Debater. My daughter Marlena has come out with a Christian music CD entitled Win This Fight. It has eight songs that she has written and performed herself. Some of the song titles are Win This Fight, Love Song to My Lord, Vessel to You, Waiting to Hear From You, Jesus Is, and Others. YouTube viewers can listen and see Marlena's music video, Jesus Is, right now, free. Just type Marlena Wessels, M-A-R-L-E-N-A-W-E-S-S-E-L-S, -S -S -E in the YouTube search box and click on her video on the page that comes next. If you would like more information about getting a copy of her CD, just email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's C-D-E-B-A-T-E-R at A-O-L dot com. Or give us a call at 512-218-8022. Thank you, and may the Lord bless you and yours. To the